four or five to so many people coming in. Yeah, the attendance is really great, actually. So glad that you're all still with us. <laughs> Perhaps some of you have just had lunch. Perhaps others are waiting for lunch at the end of this session. <laughs> I'm waiting till tomorrow for lunch. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> so just before we begin this session to um, remind you of the structure so this is the session we're going to look at the Anapanasati Sutta again the third session and Ajahn will speak on that for about the first 40 45 minutes or so and then we'll have a five minute break so that you can stretch and get your cups of tea or go to the loo. And then we'll have some Q&A. So please for the Q&A again to send them to Anne-Marie, Q&A Anne-Marie, <laughs> uh, rather than to me. And she will organize those questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So you will have that period of time um, at the end of Ajahn's uh, Sutta discussion to pop your questions in. Okay, shall I begin? I think you can begin. If Thank everyone you, is sitting, If everyone is sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Very good. So, <laughs> so far with the Anapanasati Sutta, which I've been reading out, uh, mentioned that the first part of it is making sure mindfulness is uh, established, it's given priority. And then as you become more and more mindful, as I was saying this morning with a simile of the, um, the thousand petal lotus opening up, just once you get into the present moment awareness and silence. And you know, sometimes there's so many different descriptions or definition of mindfulness you know, created by the mindfulness industry I actually prefer the being in the present moment and being silent. It's a very high standard of mindfulness, but nevertheless, it means you are really focusing on what's right in front of you right now, and not the past, not the future, and you're not adding to it with this uh, inner commentary. In other words, you really are here, aware. So inner silence, the present moment awareness, the very wonderful definition of what the mindfulness is. But the, even that definition doesn't um, recognize the different strengths of mindfulness. And that's one thing which I made almost like a, a mission on, to say there's ordinary mindfulness, like everybody who's just walking down the street, they're reasonably mindful. But then you get what happens when you're really well rested and you're very bright, you get very powerful mindfulness. And then when you have the superpower mindfulness, and the superpower mindfulness is when you can look at those clumps of bamboo in the botanical gardens and they, they really come out at you. You can see so much more detail and so much more color and texture and changes in color and the shapes and see it all interacting. You can pick up so much more. And that's almost like one of the side uh, benefits of meditation, it's just you do get more happy and more aware of what's going on in the world around you. It's like you see more and you hear more and even you taste more. I never mentioned that little simile from that first retreat I did, which was held in boarding houses, student boarding houses uh, in Bateman Street. And that was in nine, 1970, I think. And anyway, that particular retreat, because it was being held in boarding houses in the early 70s in England, that caused me a bit of fear. It caused me fear because I knew that the food in boarding houses was pretty, pretty just uh, basic, even almost disgusting. It was just usually 
um, I think, yeah, I think we had a vegetarian diet there. So it was like vegetables, maybe some beans, potatoes, oil boiled so much there was no taste left. This was boarding house cooks. And even generally in UK, the people in UK were not well known for the high cuisine, which is just quite ordinary food. And this was some of the poorest cooks, the bottom of the pile of chefs in UK at the time, managed to get jobs cooking for poor students in boarding houses. And that's the food I was going to eat for nine days. And I was scared about that. I honestly considered getting some sandwiches or some tins of something, or just sneaking out and getting some food from the Chinese takeaway, which was not far around the corner, to supplement the diet. But I never needed to because it was strange, it was weird. So at that first retreat, the food by this boarding house chef was delicious. And of course, I thought it's just my good karma. Ajahn Brahm being very lucky that managed to hit on one of the few boarding house cooks who knew how to actually to cook food instead of just boil it to death. So anyway, I enjoyed my food there. Didn't need to go and sneak some food from somewhere else. It was only afterwards, and after many years of meditating, I realized that it's nothing to do with the cook at all. It was just that my my mindfulness was so strong that it could pick up the last remnant of flavor of the boarding house cook had boiled and steamed most of the flavor away. I was sensitive in the taste of my food. And that showed me a lot about just some of the side effects of good meditation. Even the food tastes more delicious than you've ever thought before. There's no sort of criticism of the cooks, it's just the way that the, the taste faculty in your, your brain is just clean and it's powerful. You're aware. There are all these wonderful side effects of meditation which make you more aware of the world and even makes your food taste more delicious. So I mentioned how the mindfulness is really important. And after you have the mindfulness getting strong enough, then you can start to open up those first layer of petals, you know, in your side of your body, you'll find the present moment awareness and silence, which is mindfulness. And then you find your breath, and then you find the beautiful breaths. I sometimes call them beautiful breaths, but these days I prefer delightful breath. Watching the breath go in and out with this thing called Piti Sukha with joy. And the Buddha mentioned this is a mind-created happiness, simply because your mind is bright and clear, you can see more, you can feel more, and what you see is much more joyful, more aware. One of the other similes for this, which I haven't mentioned yet, but I always mention when I teach retreats over here in Australia, was that you know, being a monk, it really is you know, hard if, when you become a senior monk, it's hard to get exercise. The reason is, when I try to lift something, I was moving chairs this morning. And as I was moving chairs, somebody came up and said, no, no, we'll do that for you. Because they think it's meritorious to do it for me. <laughs> but that means I don't get exercise. And so it's so hard for me even to go to a walk. And someone will stop. Oh, I'll give you a lift. I need exercise. So anyway, this one time, many years ago, I decided, I've been, I think, living here in Australia for about seven years when this happened. And uh, I'd gone out somewhere in the morning for some task. And coming back, I had plenty of time before lunch to walk up the hill where Bodhinyana Monastery is. It's only about two kilometers, but it's a quite a steep hill. But I had all the time in the world. I was fit. It was a beautiful like spring morning, the sun was out, the grass was green, there was some water in the valley below, and there was just a beautiful time to have a bit of exercise. But every time I try to have some exercise, always something happens to disturb it. But what happened to disturb it was wonderful insights. So as I was walking up this road, Kingsbury Drive, it's called, where I've been living for seven years at that time, and 
up and down that road in the car. As I was walking, I could not recognize my surroundings. It was totally different than I remembered. And I wondered, am I in the same road? Because I started to see things I'd never seen before in seven years, looking through the window of a speeding car. Now I could see so much more. And it was so surprising for me, I just stopped in my tracks, I stood still. And as I stood still, I saw even more, more detail, more, you know, more color on the grass, the different blades of grass, the rocks in the valley over which the, the water tumbled and this beautiful tiny little waterfalls in the valley below and all the different bark on the trees. I was captivated. I'd never seen that hillside so beautiful ever before. And I enjoyed it. But after enjoying it, he started to contemplate why? Why after seven years, it was like seeing that hillside, the road on the top of which I lived. Why was it like seeing it for the first time? Why was it so beautiful now? And I use the science analogy that when you are looking through the window of a speeding car at the scenery outside, the light goes you know, through your, your iris, through the lens as well, and onto the back of the eye, onto the retina, and there's a chemical reaction there. And that chemical reaction, if it hasn't got enough time to complete, another image hits the back of the eye, and then another image, and another image, and another image which means that you don't see much detail. And even the colors are not fully formed. They're washed out like pastel colors. But once I walked slowly, the light had more time to form a proper image on the back of my eye. And also the electrical impulses going down the optic nerve had more time to actually to show my brain a fuller image. And when I stood perfectly still, just standing there, allowing the eyes just to soak up all of that light in the back of my uh, eye, the retina, and then for the, for the uh, reaction to fully complete, and the colors were just so beautiful. They were full, full yellows, full greens, full blues, full grays, full whites, and a lot of texture was there too. It was like seeing the hillside for the first time. And it did look very, very beautiful. And that was teaching me again, that with our senses, whether it's sight or hearing, smell, taste or touch, sometimes we move so fast, we don't really appreciate what's out there. And we don't see the full colors. We don't taste it fully enough if it's food. And so as we slow down in our meditation, it's like getting out of the car of your life, which is always going somewhere, often at a fast pace in order to get things done. When we slow down, like getting out of the car and walking, you find so much more beauty, so much more detail, even in the street in which you live. And when you really sometimes just stop and look, wow, it's like the life starts to emerge out of the gray pastel colors, which is what you assume life is when you're always moving fast. And there's a wonderful simile for that mindfulness that once it starts to grow, it gets strong. Powerful mindfulness, superpower mindfulness. One of the signs of superpower mindfulness is not just you see so much more, but what you'll see is delightful. The food is just such ordinary food, but it's just so delicious. And the, the rocks, they've always been there, but the rocks got more texture now, more colors, more different colors. And the whole thing is just so incredibly gorgeous. And this is just the sign your mindfulness is taking off. You have much more joy and happiness in your life. The joy and happiness has always been there, but your mindfulness is now strong that mind made mindfulness, which allows you also to see the, the breath is delightful. 
So anyway, that once that mindfulness starts to get enough, it's easy to watch the breath. And once it's uh, the mindfulness is strong enough again, the breath appears delightful. So the problem of a wandering mind, the mind just drifting off here, drifting off there, that problem is because there's not enough joy in this moment, not enough happiness here. You find if it's really happy, if you're, you know, for those of you who have TVs and stuff, if it's a very interesting program, very joyful, of course you'll watch it. But if it's boring, then of course you won't watch anything at all. Now, one of my mates from Cambridge at the time, he was, he was a treasurer of the Buddhist Society of Cambridge at the time. He's also a very um, close, he used to be anyway, close um, uh, support, close disciple of uh, Professor Hawkins. That was uh, my friend Bernard Carr, who was also a theoretical physicist and also a Buddhist. And he told me, we were joking when he came over to Perth to meet up and have a conference. He told me that sometimes when he was running these Buddhist talks, he introduced the speaker, and then even during the speaker's talk, he fell asleep. <laughs> and he was the MC. <laughs> Poor embarrassing embarrassment. Because there was no joy, no energy in that talk. And it just dulled him out. And I said, that happened to me. I was in the audience when those things happened. And I just, my head dropped and you got really sort of tired and you weren't really listening. It's one of those things that when you have mindfulness, then of course you can listen to the talks. You get so much more out of them. Just like I see much more of the road in which I travel. So you usually see that as the retreat goes on, as you develop more mindfulness, someone gives a talk and say, wow, it's an amazing talk. It's the same talk as was given a week ago, but because you're meditating, you get so much more out of the talk. You're more aware that mindfulness is more powerful. But anyway, going back to the Anapanasati Sutta, uh, the first four land, landmarks is just being able to see the breath, being able to experience it fully, full awareness of the breath from beginning to end, and it's calming down. It means there's not much space there for other things to come in to disturb you. You're just watching the breath. That's one of the reasons why. Please let the commentary disappear so that all you've got is the breath in the mind. And it's delightful, it's satisfying, it's not that hard to do. And then from there, it's delightful breath, and that's just so wonderful. It's just, of course you don't wander off because you're having a great time. And it happens sometimes that somebody just, you're having a nice deep meditation, you're not really fully into the deep meditations of, you know, where you can't hear anything. And someone says, Baba Angso, come on. Because that happened to me when I was doing walking meditation many years ago. You know what, the walking meditation, please do a lot of that because it supports the sitting meditation. Now, when you get tired of sitting, you just get up and find a nice path and just do your walking meditation. Your gaze, you know, just a body length in front of you, you know, one and a half meters, two meters, I don't know how long you are. And then just not looking to the left, not looking to the right and feeling your body move. And so you can feel the, the feet and the legs and the knee bend as you sort of move up your first foot and it moves forward. And after a while, you don't plan your steps. They just happen naturally. You walk all your life. But now you're experiencing it fully. And as you're experiencing it fully, it soon becomes very joyful. And to me, there's many occasions, it was fascinating. There's all the things which had to move just for me to lift a, a leg up, or lift a foot off the floor and move it forward. And on this one occasion, I was doing this in the first year I was a monk in Thailand. And I'd been, I think about 45 minutes, I'd been doing my walking meditations, really peaceful, very still. And that's when I heard this sound, this noise. It was like hearing a noise like 100 miles away. I could hear it, but it was like a long distance away. And it was shouting out, Brahma Wang So, that's my full name, not Ajahn Brahma. Brahma Wang So. And of course, straight first away, for this is strange. What is it? Brahma Wang So. And then I realized there was another monk who had his mouth almost next to my ear. And he was shouting, trying to get my attention because I was so into the walking meditation. 
I was in my own beautiful world. And I realized you know, what had happened, that I forgot I had an appointment that morning to go for a lunch with my preceptor, who was a really senior monk. And I'd forgotten about it. I was in my meditation having a wonderful time. And I realized I had to come out of the meditation. But it took me about two minutes, three minutes, to actually to come out and move my head to the, the monk who was asking the question and say, what? Because you're so peaceful and calm, you just can't come out quickly. If you're in a car going sort of, you know, at, well, what's it, the fifth gear or something, you can't, you can't suddenly just jump into first gear or go into reverse. That will wreck the whole engine. So I was trying the very best I could to actually to speed up. It took me a couple of minutes. But fortunately, because it was in a monastery, people understood meditation, so they gave me that time. And, but it showed me just how even in walking meditation, you can get into a very deep state of stillness. And part of that is the sense of sound is, is a long distance away. Of course, this is what happens when you get the joyful um, meditations, just watching the breath coming in and going out. It's like that's enough for the mind to be very happy. And it doesn't really allow other stuff in. Thinking about the past or the future, that's, that's gone. A beautiful experience right now. What does the mind want anything else for? And it does it automatically. You don't force it. You don't tell it anything. It's a totally automatic process, a natural process. You're going inside the lotus, and the deeper you go, the more beautiful it is. And, and it can be quite addictive. <laughs> but that addiction is praised by the Buddha. <laughs> he said, don't need to be afraid of the joys of meditation, because they lead to enlightenment. Anyway, after a while you get used to them, and they're fun, and they're wonderful things. So anyway, you get to the delightful breaths, and after the delightful breaths, the delight is what really starts to grow, and the breath starts to disappear. And then you get into the nimittas, gorgeous lights in the mind. Your happiness is getting stronger and stronger. And as that happiness gets stronger and stronger, the, the bliss, is the thing which really sort of takes over. And the nimittas, it's just the way you view the whole process. The, the lights get strong. And you should go inside of them. Always going inside to the next stage of meditation. And in that stage, you know, you're really, really still and peaceful. That's the, the 12th stage, the jhanas. And of course, the jhanas don't last forever. After a while, you emerge from those jhanas. Once you emerge from those jhanas, one of the important parts which you'll notice is the five hindrances are, are totally gone for a long time. I'm talking about hours and sometimes even days. And that's one of the, the reasons, one of the questions I ask people when they say, did, was that a jhana? I said, how did you feel afterwards? No, not just for five seconds or for a minute. This has to be for a long time. So much joy and happiness and peace, walking on clouds, just nothing upsets you. That's a sign the five hindrances have vanished. Once those five hindrances have vanished, your mind can be powerful. You can see things which sometimes you're afraid to see. And to make the point here, I've already mentioned, oh crikey, time goes so quickly. I've already mentioned my friend Bernard Carr, who was, again, a Buddhist and who introduced some of the great speakers of the time and fell asleep because the talks were too boring. And he's also a theoretical physicist who also members of the Psychic Research Society. We go around hunting ghosts together. We shared so much in our time at university. He became a physicist, a real theoretical physicist. I became a Buddhist monk. But anyway, he told me this experiment which was done in Imperial College, London. And it was a levitating flower pot experiment done by one of his friends. Now, Bernard was you know, a top physicist. So he's well known. He was emeritus. He's now emeritus professor of theoretical physics at Queen Mary College in London. So this experiment, one of his friends said they managed to work out how to levitate a flower pot, how to make it raise up into the air against the law of gravity. And so he had a lot of uh, very eminent physicists, 
scientists, experimenters, whose whole life was based on, um, on evidence and proof. And they had so many cameras in the, in the, uh, in the lecture hall in Imperial College in London, now in South Kent. That's South Kensington. And as he had all his cameras in there to make sure that if it happened, they'd have it recorded in, in infrared cameras, ultraviolet cameras, every type of cameras to make sure that if it worked, it would be proven. And so the experimenter himself brought in the flower pot in his hands to show that you know, there was no wires attached and put it on the bench in the front of the lecture hall. And then he asked something odd of his audience. And these were you know, elderly professors. He said, I need to have your, your cooperation. I want you all to help me set up the right atmosphere for this experiment to work. I want you all to start chanting Om. You know, the first word of Om Mani Padmi Hum. It's also used in Hindu culture. Om. And he, because he was, you know, these were his friends, his peer group, all these elderly physics professors started chanting OM in the lecture theater. If someone had seen them, they'd probably thought that they were going crazy because top physicists did not chant OM, but these guys did. And as they were chanting OM, the flower pot lifted up in the air. It worked the flower pot was levitated, no strings. It rose above the table and they filmed it all. Amazing. And afterwards, after the experiment was completed, a couple of those professors who his whole life was evidence-based were asked, what do you think about the levitating flower pot? And they said it never levitated. It didn't rise in the air. We've got the pictures, the videos. No, no, it was on the table all the time. They insisted. And even when they showed the videos, they said, no, no, that's fake. I was there, I saw it, it was on the table all the time. The point was that even though it did lift up into the air, it was so against their worldview. It was so contrary to some of the basic principles of their life that their conscious awareness, denied it, prevented it, even before it became a perception. They bent the truth before perception prevented the evidence, which was, again, bent. And of course, the, the real thing which happened there was that the true story, to, to amplify it a bit, that underneath that bench, an old wooden bench in science labs or lecture theatres, they had installed this huge electromagnet. <laughs> it was just electromagnetic phenomena, that's all. Nothing supernatural. But when they turn on the current in the electromagnet to raise the flower pot, it's such a large current that you can hear it humming. Mm -hmm. And to make sure they didn't notice the change in sound with the humming, they got everyone to chant om, om, om in order to hide the electric current being turned on. And that was all that was about. But that main point of the experiment was just to show that these hindrances, what you want to see, what you don't want to see, are so strong. They occur you know, like what you might call subconsciously. And even your perceptions, what you normally see, you can't rely on. Bare perception is untrustworthy, which is staggering when you look upon the, the ideas of, of, of the consequences of that. You just don't see it. So anyway, going back to the Anapanasati Sutta, that when you have experiences, powerful states of mind, the, the jhanas, and you emerge afterwards, what's banished was the five hindrances which are just wanting negativity, or you might call that denial, that's part of that restlessness and sloth and torpor and doubt, 
all those things have vanished, they're not there anymore. Which means that what you see, what you hear, what you smell, taste, touch, is real. You can trust it. Which is why it's necessary for the arising of insight and wisdom. You trust what you see. So in the Anapanasati Sutta, that after you emerge, when you learn to explore Im impermanence in this breath meditation, when you explore things fading away in breath meditation, when you learn to explore things ceasing in breath meditation, when you learn to explore relinquishing things in breath meditation, those are the four next steps of Anapanasati. What do you mean explore? It's not contemplate, I don't like that word because it's too much thinking. So what exploration is? Okay, this will do. Oh no, this is much better to hold up. I'm now sort of explain what exploration is, the way that insight happens when your hindrances are disappeared. What is it that I'm holding up right now? Can anyone say anything? You're all muted, so you can't say things, but I will just interpret or sort of imagine what you might say. It's a, a yellow square, it's paper. It's um, one of those post-it notices, you know, with the uh, sticky back on it. It's got some writing on it. It's yellow. It's maybe three inches wide, three inches long. And you have all sorts of other descriptions of it. But to really understand what it is, you keep looking until you have no more names to describe this. So all the things you've been taught this is, this is how we usually perceive things, are abandoned. And then you can start seeing this afresh. New ideas, new ways of seeing, new uses, new, new uses for this. Little by little, contemplation is going beyond what you've been taught, going way beyond what you knew and seeing things in a different way, in a new way, in an innovative way, in a way which is often much more accurate to the truth. So in order to see insight, we have to be able to look at thing, or something, sustain our awareness on this, until all the old knowledge, which is, you know, stop you being enlightened, can actually disappear so you see things anew. Real, what this is. So this is only some paper, that's all this is. Post-it notices. So what you do here, you just come out of a very deep meditation. And in that deep meditation, it's been very powerful. I already mentioned that those deep meditations are I don't have another word for this, like they're traumatic, but positive. In other words, they're so powerful, you can't sort of just ignore them. What was that? And now you have a mind which is courageous enough to see what it was. Number one, to see anicca. Now many times people understand anicca is just rise and fall, which is wrong. Anicca is much more profound than that. Anicca is seeing something which has always been there, which is Nietzsche. Nietzsche, Nietzsche means something which is regular, which is repetitive, always was there, always happens. See something which was always there, and now you see it's gone. It's not there anymore. And the simile which makes this very clear is the simile of the tadpole and the frog. A tadpole born in the water, lived all its life in the water, can never know what water is. No more than a fish could know what water is. How can you know what your body is? You've lived in it all your life. How can you know what your mind is? It's always been there for you. How can you know what the senses are? Or what will is? What your mind is? 
It's always been there for you. Just like the tadpole can't know what water is. But the difference between a tadpole and a fish is that one day the tadpole grows arms and legs. One day the tadpole just doesn't really know what it's doing. It jumps out of the, the lake. It's on dry land. And when it's on dry land, it's a very shocking experience. You can understand why the frog might be a bit afraid at first. It's totally different than whenever it's experienced before dry land. Why is it different? Something which has always been there is now gone. It's anichid. What's gone is water. Water is anicha. It's not permanent. It's irregular, not relied upon. And that actually shocks the tadpole. Good insight will shock you. Make you see things in a different way, but in a beautiful way. Ah, oh, now I get it. Oh, at last, why have I been so stupid? So yeah, when you emerge from these deep meditations, Anicca, much of the things which you thought were, were always there, you experience when they're gone. So in the first jhana, your five senses are gone. You can't hear, you can't see, you can't smell, taste or touch. Those five senses have been ticked off, turned off, and you're still perfectly aware it's just in the sixth sense with your mind and just blissed out. If ever you look at that jhana, the, the happiness of the first jhana is based on the absence of the five senses. It's, they call it the karma, K-long A-M-A. -A. It's the, the absence of that is what causes the joy, free from the irritation of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touch. You can't understand that until you experience it. And experiencing it means the five senses have vanished, anichet. The next jhana, the second jhana, is that's when, when will disappears, when choice. And some people get very scared of this idea. Well, I mean, letting go of will and choice and control, yeah. But you can't really understand what it's like, what actually is will, because it's always there for you. But then comes a time when the will vanishes. Now you know what it was. Such a relief to be still at last, to be peaceful and perfectly safe. And so this is the what Anicca is. Things you always thought were there now vanish. And after Anicca, where is it going? You explore impermanence. You get to know it in the breath meditation, you learn to explore things fading away. You can see the things fading away, your senses fading away, your will fading away. And as you go deeper in meditation, you get to the incredible peaceful state of the fourth jhana. And that fourth jhana, the Buddha described it, and you know, sometimes you, you, know, you have your own experiences and how on earth can I describe this? Quite frankly, I mentioned this to many people, but when you read how the Buddha described it, oh, it's incredible. He has made some amazing insights into those states and explained them so simply but powerfully. He called it like the purity of insight. Sati, Purisa, Sati Parisuddha. You, the mind, so the, Sati Parisuddha, the purity of mindfulness, I should have said. Mindfulness doesn't get better than this, more powerful than this. Incredibly still, but so clear. And afterwards, in the next stages, because it's still, things disappear. And then the mind starts to disappear. It vanishes, it fades away. So your will has faded away a long time ago. Now your consciousness mind consciousness starts to fade away and then lots and lots of bliss until everything ceases. And then the mind turns on again and you go back the way you came in. Mind starts to turn on, will starts to turn on, 
five senses turn on as you emerge out of these deep meditations. So you understand from your own experience and your fearlessness, the hindrances disappearing. You can really explore things fading away and things ceasing in this breath meditation. Really ceasing. These are powerful experiences. I'm not holding back with you. This is like enlightening experiences. And you learn to explore relinquishing things in breath meditation. Letting go of things. That's what you've been doing. Not holding on to stuff, but allowing them to disappear. And it's a perfectly healthy, blissful, and you get so many insights into how the Buddha taught and what the Dhamma is. They're life changing. That's what this is supposed to do. Okay, it's meditation, you know, just for everybody, just makes you more healthy, more peaceful, get to have more understanding about your body and mind, the way you speak and how to, to live with other people, how to have good relationships. You can just see just, you know, monastic communities. You know, yeah, you know, we just get some nice meditations, but we can still talk about bad bricks in the wall, get great insights into the door of my heart open, no matter who you are, no matter what you are. Beautiful insights. So as well as you're just disappearing, you get these incredible powerful ways of healing and helping in this world. So yeah, you're understanding about relinquishing things, letting go of stuff, because there's nothing in it for me. Me disappears. You relinquish everything. That becomes a, a, a real renunciant. That's what we call the monastic order, the renunciants. We renounce everything and it's not we decide to do it, it's just what happens. So I'm just going back to the sutta now before I run out of time. Having seen with impermanence, fading away cessation of relinquishments of the five hindrances, you are mindful with equanimity. Now that's, I said something there which was interesting. I'm going to go back. That's how I translated it. I'm going to go back how Bhikkhu Bodhi translated this. This is from the Pali Text Society, a translate, no, published by Wisdom Publications. Ah, well, I just. I'm oh, not sorry, just going to hear. Okay, this is. On the occasion I shall breathe in and out, contemplating cessation, contemplating fading away, contemplating impermanence. Uh, on that occasion, having seen with wisdom the abandoning of covetousness and grief, they closely look on with equanimity. That's uh, how the Bhikkhu Bodhi describes this. And the reason I paused here, because this word covetousness and grief this is just linking the four Satipatthanas with Anapanasati. Covetousness and grief, these are the words, uh, loke uh, abhija domanasang, which if ever you've heard about the Satipatthana Sutta, they say that every one of those four Satipatthanas, from the body stuff, feeling or experience, mind, and these dhammas, so you can only do Satipatthanas after you have abandoned grief and covetousness from the world, which is a Professor Rice David's old translation, grief and covetousness for the world, Loke Abhija, Dominasan. And when I first came across that, as a, a young monk, I thought there's something wrong here because covetousness and grief for the world, what's that got to do with Satipatthana practice? But then, of course, when you started to learn Pali as a monk and started to actually read the suttas for yourself in Pali, you came across those words many times. Loke Abhija and the word Dhammanasa. And you found, and it was an eye-opener for me, Loke Abhija is a synonym for the first hindrance, Kamachanda, the right desire, wanting. And it's used as a synonym many, many times, mostly in the Anguttara Nikaya. And Domanasa is a synonym for 
are the second hindrance. No, uh, negativity, ill will. And so what those two words mean in the Satipatthana, vinaye, vinaye loke abhijada manasa, means having restrained those first two hindrances, or the five hindrances. When I looked into the commentary of the Satipatthana suttas, it made it very clear that what it means is those two, the leaders of a group, the other three are included, which is the way that Pali language works. And so the two commentaries, the Satipatthana Sutta uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya and the Mahasatipatthana in the Dika Nikaya, both commentaries say that what this word means is having restrained the five hindrances before you start Satipatthana, having weakened them. And here we have in the mindfulness of breathing saying that fourth of the uh, 16, the fourth group, the fourth quartet in the 16 steps of Anapanasati is saying that is why on this occasion you have restrained the five hindrances. Oh, sorry. So on this occasion, we're mindful of mind objects, having restrained the five hindrances. So oh, I've lost it again. Uh, are you having seen with wisdom the impermanence, fading away, cessation, and relinquishment of the five hindrances? You are mindful with equanimity. So even the Buddha is pointing out here in the Anapanasati Sutta that the one of the goals, one of the purposes, one of the effects, if you like, of that last four steps of Anapanasati is for you to experience for yourself the impermanence, fading away, cessation and relinquishment of the five hindrances. You see that. When those five hindrances are gone, you can see so much more as, as well. And of course, that leads to the great insights where you can complete the seven enlightenment factors. But that's tomorrow, not today. So hopefully, I didn't totally bamboozle, discombobulate you with that, uh, uh, the last four steps of Anapanasati. But hopefully, I'll put some ideas and insights into you so that when they happen, you won't be afraid. You'll be able to enter those jhanas, come out afterwards, and then you start to explore what happened and see things just which were always there for you and now gone. You see things which faded away and ceased and see how to relinquish things, how to really let go. Sometimes when people ask, how do you let go? This is how you see it. Not how you explain it to others, but how you see it for yourself. So thank you so much for listening. Now we're going to have a five minute break. So this is where you can go to the toilet, where you can just have a cup of tea or something. We're back in five minutes to do the questions and answers. And also gives you an opportunity to post those Q&A to Anne-Marie. Yay! That's okay. Okay. We have quite a few questions coming in. So if you can please keep them as concise as possible, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Excellent. We have some water. And I'll be quiet too, because otherwise, you know, people feel they're missing out on something. Yeah.
Jan, just to say you're also welcome to turn off your video for five minutes if you want a break. Oh yeah, I, I just yawned, so I turned it on so I could yawn, and so people don't see me yawning <laughs> and see my teeth. Okay, I'm going to stop my video. <laughs> it's nine o'clock almost here, nine p.m. So many of my days are busy days, and I usually get up at four o'clock in the morning. I know. No matter how I feel. Back again. So it looks like most people are trickling in. Shall we start? Excellent. Okay, I don't know if the word trickling is the right word when I just been to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not incontinent. <laughs> so okay. yeah, it grows smoke sometimes, but I nah, enjoy it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. the first okay. So the first question is from Eric. Oh. And he's asking, is breath meditation considered air element meditation when we're aware of the breath, the physical feeling of the breath passing over the skin and through the body, being aware of the feeling, or is it more about being aware of and knowing the breath rather than the feeling of the air passing through the body? He thinks there's a distinction as to where we put our focus and which way to be aware about it that he gets confused about. First of all, I wouldn't put your focus anywhere. Let the mind do it. Let it happen naturally. You just be an observer of whatever's happening in the moment. And that's the most important thing in the whole world. And just care for it. Or if you like the simile of the sun, the sun shines on everything in the world. It doesn't choose what to shine on. But it gives the, the kindness and the awareness necessary to open things up. So the marvelous and the kindness are in your breath. When it happens, it happens when it wants to. And is it the air element? Is it this feeling? You can actually commit both of those things. And the point is that you just notice the breath when it comes to you. You don't choose to watch the breath. It just the breath is the only thing left to watch, the most noisy thing to watch. Not kind of noisy, but the most powerful thing to watch and so it may be afterwards you can do the contemplations is this an air element of course it is part of the air element 
it's not just air element, it's touching the body element as well. If, you know, your flesh or your nose, whatever you're noticing it. And it's also the consciousness elements, there's so many elements which are involved in this. But I must admit that I always have a little bit of trouble with four elements because I was a physicist before. And to me, it doesn't make much sense to think of the physical world in the form of elements. I much more prefer to have you know, the three fundamental forces and the uh, elemental particles. But anyway, that's just how I look at life. But if, you, if the four elements works, fine. But the main purpose of the four elements is to just look at things. There's four elements there, so why do you give more value to one part of four elements, like a gold watch, and other type of four elements, like a, a piece of um, old newspaper? So four elements tend to be an equalizer. So you don't get attached to some things and you don't get negative towards other things. But not part of breath meditation. Okay, could I just clarify the second point that Eric made? So I understood he was asking about whether with the Anapana we focus more on the feeling of the breath or we're aware more of the feeling or the knowing of it. Well, first of all, in the first tetrad, the first quartet, whatever it's called, it's uh, of when you know the breath is long, short, when you know the hold of the breath and you calm the breath down. That's very much a physical feeling, the fifth sense, the six senses, touch. And then the next part of it is where you notice the joy and happiness of the breath. That is more like not just a sense of touch, but a bit of the mind coming into it. It's like knowing the breath. When you come to the next part where the images come up, you're not knowing the breath at all. The breath is gone. It's just knowing. It's just a sixth sense. It's just starting to dominate the proceedings. Great. Thank you. So the next question is from Hiranti, and she's asking, could you please describe the process from jhanas or nimitta to the form, and I think she means to the formless jhanas in Sama Samadhi? Okay. It's you don't have a process, so it just happens, you go inside. And just say for the fourth jhana, it's a, sometimes they call it equanimity. Sometimes the Buddha quite rightly, I can't, can't say that quite rightly, just judging the Buddha. It also describes it as just the, the bliss of equanimity and different type of happiness and joy. Very, very still, and that's so satisfying. But remember, when things are still, things start to disappear. And when they start to disappear, this is actually where those ways of being conscious, the, what you might call the, uh, the frameworks by which the mind can know the world start to vanish. Like space, dimensions, start to vanish. And I know that sometimes people translate it as infinite space. I like to call it like unbounded space, un untethered space. Space is about to disappear. And the simile which I have used before, it tends to work like with time. When you get into the present moment, it's, it's no time, it's this moment, it's just a dot. It's no time, but it feel when you're in the present moment, you've got all the time in the world. So it's like the, the measurement of time is vanishing. The measurement of space is, uh, of extension is disappearing in the first of the Arupa states. And then the, sometimes they call it infinity of consciousness, which people like that word, because they always like infinite consciousness ideas. But anyway, the, it's much better to say is that consciousness has also become untethered. It becomes unmeasured, unbounded. In other words, you can't measure. The consciousness which measures things is vanishing. And then you get nothingness, nothing left. The mind knows there's nothing left. So the parts of the mind, the way it can know things is disappearing. And then finally, not finally, but almost finally, neither perception nor non-perception. 
this just happens naturally is the mind is still and just proceeds from one stage to another automatically. And you only know this process in these stages once you emerge. When you're inside of this, it just you can't choose what to do and how to how to go. It is what happens quite naturally, just the amount of letting go power, if you like, momentum you take into the meditation. And as the mind starts to vanish in either perception or non-perception, what that means is that what you're seeing is nothing there. But somebody's knowing there's no perception. So it's both it is and it isn't, depending on which way you look at it. And of course, that is just so refined. But that soon disappears and you're in cessation. Cessation of perception and feeling, no knowing, the mind is turned off. Then you come out afterwards. Okay, great. There's another question on the Arupa Jhanas from Samantha and she's asking, um, is, it su is it necessary to go into the Arupa Jhanas or sufficient to reach the fourth jhana? She's heard there's a danger that you can get stuck in the Arupa realms for eons and not reach the final goal of Nibbana because you can't hear the Dhamma. Why did the Buddha go into Parinibbana in the fourth jhana and not after the 16th step of Anapana? So two yeah. slightly different questions there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes, if it, first of all, what I really should do is ask if the person has achieved even the first jhana yet, so they really know <laughs> what they're talking about, because otherwise people can get very, very confused. And again, the um, I do the question of emergence of, of how the Buddha entered cessation, entered parinibbana through the fourth jhana, and that was something which. You're so still. It does seem to be that if you go through the Arupas and then you cease, it's a temporary cessation. But if instead of going through the Arupas, then the last, the fourth jhanas, and then a person just stays there and disappears, lets go, and the body turns off. Because in the other jhanas, the body doesn't turn off. And the only reason why you know the person has not died, but they're in one of the deep meditation jhanas, is their body is warm. It's a strange phenomena, but this has happened. I've experienced cases of this a few times when people are still warm, even though they're not breathing. And sometimes there's one case, this gentleman who's in Australia and he had a, a deep meditation. His wife thought he died. And he was admitted to hospital, the emergency department, and the doctor put an ECG and an EEG on him and both were flat lines. He was perfectly aware, but deep inside. And he came out when his meditation finished and just shocked the doctor and the wife as well. And the, wife, the doctor, the only reason why I didn't send him straight down to the morgue was that his body was still warm. So that was weird because usually there's no heartbeat and there's the the uh, no brain activity, usually you, you go cold. It's perfectly okay. But anyway, that's just a little bit of an example. Not to scare because he had a wonderful time. He said it was the best time of his life. <laughs> so nothing to be scared of, but amazing experiences. And the uh, why the Buddha left through the fourth time, I think it was because the Arupas, the cessation there is a temporary and you can't really stop totally from there. And for the, what's the other question? Is it necessary oh, yeah. to experience the Arupas? Or is no, the fourth no, jhana no. sufficient? Even the first jhana is sufficient to get fully enlightened. And you don't get stuck in the Arupa realms for eons and eons and eons and eons. And time has no meaning for you anyway. You come back again. I and mean, if you get to the those states, now there's one suitor somewhere once somewhere it says, if you get to those states, you're a non-returner. So you may get in the, uh, the Arupa states for eons, but it's a pretty nice place to get stuck. And when you come out afterwards, you're usually a non-returner anyway, so you're not going to have much more time in samsara. You've got all the information you need to get in mind. Okay. Okay, changing the tone a little bit. Um, Maddie yeah, has, okay, a yeah. has a cheeky question. She says, Excellent. in the Levit in the levitating flower pot experiment, how was it that not one single physicist in the audience could guess that this was a trick of electromagnetism? 
I'm sure they were smart enough to guess this. Sometimes you would think that, but a lot of times that people are not see they're not looking for it. Because you now this was one of their friends, one of the uh, people they respected. And they didn't hear these sort of telltale signs of like powerful current being turned on. So because of that, they managed to, to trick the scientists. Sometimes you always think the scientists are just so wise. But I've seen many of them <laughs> that are being tricked. Even the one of Bernard Carr's friends, who was a, the head ghost hunter of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, a fellow called Dr. Tony Cornell, who's now passed away. But he always said that he was so knowledgeable about you know, tricky things which people do. But he would always, when he went to, to check out whether there was a ghost, he'd always take a professional magician with him. And the professional magician would give him so much insight into how people can trick you into thinking there is a ghost there. And he said it always was a rule for him. He'd always go to investigate some hauntings or some ghost activities with a professional magician. Otherwise, he'd sometimes miss some obvious signs which the magician had based his career on and could see straight away. So physics is pretty easy to trick. <laughs> oh, thanks for letting us know. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing that ever since I've known you. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay so jake has a question he's asking how can you suggest how to distinguish self-kindness self-care from following the defilements it's difficult to do that unless you have about in the five hindrances but just as a rule of thumb if it leads to more peace to more mindfulness to more contentment a better ability just to live simply and relate to other people with kindness rather than what, what you want, then you find that it's going in the right direction. So I'm employing that simile of the fifth hindrance of doubt, that if it's leading in the right direction, you can follow that. You can't see exactly where it leads to because you're in the mist. But you know it goes downhill and eventually you follow the downhill path, you'll come underneath the mist. Great. Okay. Um, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to try and get through as many as possible. And, and I'll do them more brief answers, if I may. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Suzanne's saying that this morning in meditation, she had some colourful lights appearing quite quickly, but they arose at a stage when her body hadn't disappeared. She was completely aware of the body but could and could feel the breath in the whole body. How could it happen in this sequence? It does because what happens is the mind becomes very strong. So you've got the five senses and that this is the, the amplitude. And you've got the mind and the mind is usually quite weak. But as you meditate more and more and more, the amplitude of the five senses and the amplitude of the mind become pretty even. So sometimes the mind can actually appear even though you've still got your five senses haven't stopped yet. So what's happened is your five senses were, you know, still there, but your mind sense, the sixth sense, was getting very strong, which is why you could see the some limiters there. And it does happen that sometimes, you know, when you do lots and lots and lots of meditation, your mind is really strong. You just, you know, had a jhana, and then you come out afterwards, and you've got this big limiter in front of your head when you're having your lunch. And you always got to eat it through the limiter. It's not a very nice thing to do. But it's still, the mind is so strong, it's just you know, almost dominant. So that's not sort of un uncommon. But the thing to do, if you're aware of the body and you're aware of the breath and this beautiful limiter comes up, let the mind choose. And very often the mind will just go into that limiter and just go really deep. So let the mind make the decisions. So don't choose which one should I do. So ask your mind, what do you want to do? Let the mind choose. Okay, Augustina has a question as well about the limiters. So she's saying, if the lights are coming from the mind, then where is all the peace, bliss, and stillness from the jhanas coming from once the mind is not there? So I think she's hey, understood yeah. it that the mind's not there in jhana. Could you? No, elaborate? no, the mind is. Explain. The mind that. is liberated. The mind is liberated from the five senses in the body and all the jhanas. So in the first jhana, 
this you know, this mind is very strong. It's very you're very aware. And as you go deep into the jhana, the fourth jhana, that's where the mind reaches its peak of light power. Really still. Mindfulness is the strongest and pure there. It's only after those four jhanas does the mind start to fade away. So the right. sixth sense is always there. Um, Matthias is asking, is it possible to enter a deep meditation directly out of a sleeping state? Yes, well, not really, but you know, I, can, I think I understand what you're saying. But sometimes, you know, when you are doing a lot of meditation, even when you're sleeping, sometimes you can have dreams of nimittas or experience of nimittas in there. And uh, sometimes, like one monk I know very well, he just was you know, having this incredible nimitta in when he was laying down having a sleep and it was so powerful, you wake up and you know, he, that nimitta is still there and you can go almost straight into a jhana. So it's not as if, you know, that, you know, you just fast and sleep, you wake up, oh, what time is it? And then go into a jhana. <laughs> it means, you know, you're almost like uh, in those deep states or in a nimitta state while you're, while you're in bed. Does that explain Great. it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. From Christoph, he's asking how to bring the joy of silence to the mind. Sometimes his inner talk is like a little child who can't stop talking and just wants to have more fun. Yeah. You know, sometimes you go out into nature and just have a walk in nature. And there's much more fun happening in nature than what's happening in your mind, when your brain, rather, with all that talking. And you have a walk in nature and just make yourself as open as possible to the sound of the, the wind rustling the, the tree leaves or the sound of the, the brook was bubbling over just the creek. And all the words, they can't describe that. All that sort of inner chatter is just realized so gross when you have the real thing right there in front of you. An example of that, there was this cartoonist over in Australia called Lunig. And one of his cartoons, which I really loved, was of this family watching the TV and watching the, some nature channel, the picture of a sunset. And that was in the left half of the single uh, frame cartoon, family watching the sunset on TV. On the right hand part, there was an open window where the sunset was actually happening. And it was, why do we want to watch things on TV rather than when it's really there happening? Why do we want to think about things and play things when if you just look? What you're trying to describe and play with, the reality is right here with us. We don't need to think about it. And after a while, when you get <coughs> uh, recognized the silence, become familiar and at ease with it, it's always much more delightful than all the thoughts and fantasies and the play games which the mind can bring up. Reality is actually quite beautiful when you're mindful. Just like that hillside delightful. Great. Okay, we have a question from Kinga. She says she's a beginner in meditation. Um, she's understood or perhaps misunderstood that for meditation, she needs mindfulness. But for strong mindfulness, she needs meditation. So to her, it's like a vicious circle. She feels lost and the mindfulness is still weak. Could you please advise? Be patient. It's a spiral. The, you know, the two need one another. And they will grow together. So, you know, you're, you're mindful. It's a bit weak at first. But then you start to meditate, start to let go, relax to the max. Be kind. And the fire, you find that the mindfulness gets a bit stronger. And if you're on a meditation retreat, sometimes you don't realize how strong it's getting. And suddenly when you go home afterwards and you meet other people, and they say, wow, what drug have you been taking? You're so much more mindful and so much more happy now. And it's, that's where you get a lot of good feedback that the mindfulness has actually gone stronger. Your happiness has gone stronger. Your energies have improved when you meet your family and friends and relations. That's happened so many times to me that people on retreats, the example I remember this executive from Sydney who had to, she said she had to grovel to her boss to get the time off. But when she got back to the office after nine days of retreat, 
her first thing her boss said, what drug is Ajahn Brahm giving you in Perth? I don't care if it's illegal or not, but please bring me back some next time because you're just such a different uh, executive in my office. So other people can see very clearly just how your mindfulness and your happiness grow. And sometimes you miss it because it grows so slowly with you and you only see it changing little by little every day. But the boss or your family members see it, whoa, you really have grown. So mindfulness and meditation, they grow together. Okay, a question from Rob. He's asking, how important are all the other factors of the Eightfold Path in order to enter the first jhana? They're all really important. It's a, it's a right view. you. There's a sutta which actually says this, a sutta of teaching the Buddha. He said, from right view, that strengthens the right motivation, the right letting go of being kind, being gentle, not trying to attain things when you see non-self. And that really strengthens your ability to keep your precepts. So there's no point to breaking precepts and amassing more stuff or being hurtful to others. So, you know, from that, the three other three precepts are very strong. And from that, this, <coughs> what we talked about the other day, this right renunciation. And the reason you do that is because that strengthens the joy and the power of overcoming your five hindrances. The first seven, sorry, the first six factors of the Eightfold Path, part of their purpose is to weaken the power of the five hindrances. So you can do Satipatthana, those five hindrances in a very weak state. And after the Satipatthana, you knock them out with the Samadhi, the stillness. So those first factors are you know, quite important, but it happens naturally. You don't have to think, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. You just enjoy the meditation and you find that strengthens your wisdom and your renunciation and your kindness and your sense of peace. Great. There's a similar question asking about the relationship of kindness and awareness. Do we naturally become more aware and kind in daily life by consistently practicing meditation? In other words, we don't need to worry about forcing awareness, but we just let the mind be, counter unwholesomeness with metta and other antidotes and become more present organically. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. You've got Excellent. that one. Yay. Okay, John says that in this morning's meditation, it seemed to last only seconds. And then he noticed that Ajahn Brahm seemed like you, so calm. Can you explain how that happened? Sometimes when we get into the present moment, sometimes time loses its meaning. What time is, is a measurement between the past and the present, or the present and the future, or from the past to the future. When you're just in the present moment, there's no way of measuring which means that time and its normal understanding or experience disappears just in this moment. That's why sometimes you can meditate for hours. If you really get into deep meditation, so many people say this, oh, they're going to really, really deep meditation. And they came out afterwards and it was four hours. And they said, I only sit for 20 minutes. And they think the clock is wrong. And the clock is not wrong. You just got into a nice deep meditation as time has lost its meaning. You, you become free of the prison of time. And what a wonderful idea that is. Time is like a prison and now you've managed to find uh, the escape tunnel. Yay. Great. So Piotr is asking, when the mind is guided into silence between the thoughts, he hears a static high pitched sound that becomes deeper and deeper and is clearly inner, not outer. And it makes him not hear so much in the outside. Is it okay to hear the silence in this way or should we try to find absolute silence beyond this inner hum? Or do you mean silence in some other way? Can you elaborate exactly what you mean by silence? Because it seems impossible to him to get absolute silence even when thoughts are silent. Okay, so he's hearing that silence. vibration. Excellent, that's okay. As long as the vibration doesn't, doesn't change. In other words, it, it relaxes, it calms down. So it's a constant noise rather than things changing. Then you find if it's a constant noise, it disappears. It's only when things change does the sense of sound keep turned on. If nothing 
changes. There may be a high pitch sound, a low pitch sound. If it's constant, it has to disappear. After a while, the sound doesn't notice it anymore. The, the, the hearing doesn't notice it anymore. Good. Same you know, ordinary people that have a, a fan in their room or an air con on. And after a while, it's, it's disturbing. But if it keeps this constant sound, the ambient sound, you don't hear it after a while. Yeah. So not to pay it too much importance. Huh? Indeed, yeah. Just yeah. let it be. Okay. All right. Sabina said that on the first day, she wants to clarify if she's going into the on the in the right direction. On the yeah. first day, when her breath started to disappear, she felt like her body was not with her. And on the second day, her yeah. body disappeared and she thinks she saw herself in a past life, like a picture of a man. And she knew it was her. But then in the next one, she got inside another person and felt their face as being kind of disfigured and someone who wore a heavy helmet. And then she came out of meditation. Is that a normal yeah. experience? It is not really normal, but understandable. It's not, it's not uncommon. In the sense it's not everyone will get those experiences of past lives, but because you're getting into deep meditation, and the way you described it, I think that possibly could be true memories of a previous life. Just the way you described the, the process, the body disappearing and vanishing, which means you can access those things. But if they're causing you a bit too much problem at this stage of your meditation, what you can do is as you start to meditate, just make a resolution, say, I will not remember such past lives. In your own language, usually repeat three times, and then you'll find that will block them from disturbing you. Or if you get sort of uh, feeling you're a soldier or something disfigured, or you know being killed or tortured in a difficult, painful situation, you can always come out any time by just reminding yourself like another life or earlier or something else, please. Because if the mind is in a deep meditation, then those, some of those words, I don't mean like make it complicated, make it very simple, it's just a little prompt. You find your mind is, the only simile I have is it may not be the best simile, but sometimes people used to have these dogs in the home they train. They say, go and get the newspaper, go and get my slippers. And the dog would just follow the instructions absolutely without any, any hesitation. And that's like your mind when it's nice and pure. You tell it what to do and it does it immediately. So you can tell your mind just no, enough of that and the mind will stop. Just like a well-trained dog. We've got four more quite chunky, uh, important questions, I would say. Okay. Go yeah. yeah. Okay. Only chunky, only chunky well. monks can answer chunky questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not huge questions. Okay. Um, so Inga says, on the first day, you said that so many women have breast cancer nowadays. Do you have any insight into why this might be? That's basically, no. I'm not quite sure why, whether it's too much stress. It's usually some stress or problems in the pollution or whatever. But instead of worrying what the cause is, it's just one of the, ones, one of the great remedies is learning how to meditate and relax your body. So cancers can vanish. I've seen that too many times to actually deny it. And because you've seen it many times, you have to share it with others. Yeah. Great. Matt is saying that he experiences sometimes um, some ob obsessive compulsive disorder, which is like supercharged anxiety. It fills up his shopping bags very quickly and sometimes overflows into the meditation. Is there a way to deal skillfully with these echoes of emotions as we go deeper so that they don't pull us back? Uh, make those resolutions again, that when you put down your shopping bags, make sure you don't go and get another shopping bag <laughs> to fill these things up with. And to actually give, I don't ever think that you're an obsessive compulsive disorder person. This is one, beautiful uh, little insight. There's no such thing as a criminal. There's no such thing as a terrorist. There's no such thing as someone with OCDC. There's no such thing even as a schizophrenic. And I got that from the, the professor in charge of schizophrenia in uh, Singapore, who was a, a Christian. And uh, he stopped me after my talk and wanted to have a discussion. 
and he said he was impressed with what I said because that's how he practices treating schizophrenia in Singapore. And I asked him, how do you treat schizophrenia in Singapore? He said, I don't. He was the head of the schizophrenia unit in Singapore. He said, well, what do you do then? He said, I treat the other part of the patient, which is the schizophrenic. When I heard that, I, I, I paid my respects to him. I said, well done, because if you treat the part of the person which isn't schizophrenic, that part grows. And you respect them, and they, you know, the schizophrenia starts to disappear. And that was an you know, anecdote from a professor in Singapore with responsibility for treating that, not just like a monk. So same with OCDC, obsessive compulsive disorder, not OCDC, I'm confusing that with ACDC, the rock band from Perth. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I see there are obsessive compulsive disorder. It's only sometimes that's there. But if you believe you are OCD, then it will grow. Yeah. But if you focus on the other part which is not, that will grow. And if you focus on a person that's in jail because they're a criminal, then they will stay as a criminal. If you focus on the part of them which is not a criminal, all the other things they've done in their life, then that will grow. And when they come out of jail, they'll be free. So that's one way of dealing with OCD. You're not OCD. You have moments of OCD. Look at the other moments, the other parts of you. Okay. So a couple about the nature of the self or the non-self. Okay. So Rong Hui is asking, what is it that lets go when one lets go? And what is it that's caught up again after meditation ends? What lets go is, if you're meditating, say this is an example for Venerable Chanda. When you let go, Ajahn, Venerable Chanda, it's me letting go. In other words, I brainwash you with all the talks which I've given. So that's the only way you can really let go. It's one of the reasons why to even be a stream when you need the words of another. And this is just how Buddhism actually transmits from generation to generation. Enlightened beings who teach. And that gives you the opportunity to let go. You can't do it by yourself. It's programmed into you. And that sort of changes the programming of attaching, which you've had for so many lives. Okay, it's simple. Then... It's, yeah, you don't do very much. You just mention that. And then that's enough to allow a person to let go. So, yeah. Yeah, um, a question from Fabrizio. Is it correct to say that as long the, as the mind fabricates wanting, it perceives and experiences the sense of self, and that the sense of self is the way that this mind experiences wanting? And so Anapanasati is a method to enhance the knowing and to weaken the doing, so the knowing will no longer be able to experience the doer, which is the disappearing of the me. <laughs> yeah, it's, but so you're not just the doer, you're also the knower as well. So for both of those to disappear, but just one at a time. And for, I used to call these the two citadels of the self, just like in the old castles of Europe, they had like centers where the last places you would defend. And for your sense of self, most people these days don't identify their body as themselves, but they certainly identify their doer, their will, and their mind consciousness as, as themselves. It's very difficult to, you know, to get that close to actually to see the will vanish, the doer disappear, and to see the doer as the cause of so many problems in your life. And later on, you see the sense of knowing vanish as well. Peace at last. So those two are, disappear in Anapanasati in all types of meditation. They disappear temporarily, first of all, to give you an idea what it's like. A person who's been in a jail, they don't for many, many years, and we're talking here about lifetimes of a human being, they don't release a person straight away. Okay, you're free today. They give them little temporary releases, first of all, like weekend release. They let them go out to do a bit of jobs outside, first of all, so they can get used to what it's like outside of jail. And these the weekend releases, that's like jhanas, a temporary release from samsara. They're not real release, and they still go back to jail. They give you a taste of what it's like. 
so that when you do go deeper, you don't feel afraid. Okay. It's half past and there's a couple more small ones. Are you up for uh, Please, that yes, or? I'm up for it. Yes, yeah. Yes. I'm a bit tired, but I'm fine. Okay, lovely. If anyone else needs to go, please feel free, but it's nice to see if we can cover these other questions quite short. So from Pedro, how is Aditana, the sitting of strong determination, helpful or related to jhanas? It's uh, trying, sometimes I've heard people trying to do this. It's, I've never heard it in the, or seen it in the suttas. I've never heard it from a monk like an Ajahn Chah or any of the forest tradition, making resolutions. Oh, my I experience this, my experience that. And certainly saying strong determinations that reeks too much of your will. Small determinations, which is not to achieve things, but to renounce things. As I say, if I have fear in my meditation, I will not feel fear. Letting go of things sometimes works, but getting things I don't think works. So determinations, oh my, I let go, fine. Other determinations, oh my, I get this. I don't think that works. Too much sense of self. All right, Sebastian's saying that when yesterday you talked about sleepiness and when you were a young monk, you would just continue to sit. Yeah. But yesterday you said that when we feel sleepy, we should apply loving kindness, letting go and go to sleep if we need to. Excellent, Could you yes. explain the difference between these two cases? In other words, the, when should we sleep and when should we continue? When I was a young monk, I was stupid. I didn't really know what to do. And I've learned much more from that time. And so for you, don't be what I did in my first years as a monk, fight the sleepiness. It didn't work. And these days I advise people, if you are tired, take a rest, take a break. And you find you're not indulging. If you really are physically tired, even like a bit emotionally drained, take a rest. And it's like your brain is saying, thank you. It's not an indulgence, it's a caring. And afterwards, when you wake up, your mind is pretty bright and happy. You can better take it so well with a bright and happy mind. So I didn't understand what I was supposed to be doing. And that was why I did the wrong thing for so many years. You got another right. one there, obviously. I've got quite a few, yeah. So maybe you can just say when you've when you've heard okay yeah enough. okay <laughs> okay so Suzanne's asking how can she tell the difference between a nimitta and her imagination? You know that a lot a lot of time you can't, and it's a wonderful thing to know that because sometimes people can imagine nimittas, and there's a type of meditation to do that. It's called kasina meditation. So the nimittas are really really sort of simple and beautiful, because these are mind made objects. So, but those nimittas, to be able to take them further, have to be just when your body starts to vanish and disappear. And so the best way of getting those is to get into some nice, say, breath meditation and they happen quite naturally. Imagination can sometimes force things. Okay. So Volk is saying that yesterday they had a feeling that they need to prepare to die and let go of attachments and of the body. And this was a positive and peaceful feeling. Afterwards, they managed to let go of their body and after that had a better connection with it. What stage of meditation could this be? And do I need to let go of all attachments because this is kind of scary? I don't know what's going to be yeah. left. Just do it little by little. Don't just go too far. Sometimes people get some success in meditation. I want to go further. Just enjoy your success so far and just take it slowly. You don't need to let go of all attachments in one go. Let go of them little by little, stage by stage. Otherwise, it gets a bit too much and people do get scared. See what it's like when you let go of your body. See what it feels like. It feels great. So it means it's much easier to let go of your body next time. And next time, maybe let go of the thoughts. And that's sometimes it's a bit scary for people. But after a while, it's just wonderful having no thoughts. And you let go of, you know, the, even the breath. So your whole body's vanished. And it, it might be scary at first, but then after a while, oh, this is wonderful. But little by little, let go stage by stage. And don't do too much in one go. Otherwise, again, I don't know why people are in such a rush. 
look, I say this in some of my retreats, sometimes people see them putting far too much effort in. I say, look, there's another, there's another three days to go of this retreat. If you get enlightened tonight, what are you going to do the next three days? <laughs> That's just a bit of fun and games. But in other words, let the whole thing be natural. Don't force feed you know, your sort of, uh, I don't know what you grow in your garden, your apple tree or your tomato plants. If you force feed them, yeah, they grow very quickly, but they're not very tasty. <laughs> Good. Okay, Lewis is asking that sometimes when wishing well is overpowered by unpleasant experiences, I try even harder to wish them well. And if it doesn't work again, I notice that there's more restlessness, which then creates doubt. Can I keep trusting on making wishing well to anything I experience as my only concern? Uh, just wishing well. Even these days, that when I, uh, to the monks I live with, I say, have a good evening. I don't actually say that anymore. I say, have a good evening if you want. But I'm not going to try and control you. Because if you wish well to people, sometimes they don't want to be well. And they have a right to be grumpy and unwell. So just, you know, I wish you freedom rather than feeling well. I wish you peace, whatever. But, you know, just try if you want to. You don't have to. I'm not going to try and control you. May all beings be happy and well. Some beings don't want to be happy and don't be well. And it's not my, my job, it's not my responsibility to force them to be happy and well. It's a different take on the loving kindness, which I quite enjoy. Okay, shall we do one last question to end? Yeah, okay, go on, yeah, one last yeah. one. One last. So Bogdan's asking, on the matter of the Eightfold Path, the word Sama is sometimes, in Jainism, in Jainism as well, translated as enlightened. So Sama, Samadhi means enlightened, etc. Um, thus the Eightfold Path is already the goal for practicing awakened view, um, which requires one to be awakened, and yet to become awakened one needs the Eightfold Path. So how yeah. do, do you resolve the catch-22? Is it oh, yeah, dialectic? Yeah, yeah, it's just dialectic. So samma doesn't mean enlightened. It means it's uh, which would lead to the enlightenment, connected to enlightenment, which is, you know, it is correct, it is right, it is appropriate for the purpose of getting enlightened. The Eightfold Path is not to be practiced if you don't want to be enlightened, because <laughs> that's where it's going to lead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So if you want to sort of, you know, uh, become president of the United States, don't practice the Eightfold Path. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would want to become president of the United States, but that's their choice. <laughs> so, so if you want to be president of the United States, you have to have different samas, <laughs> different sort of uh, what is appropriate to the goal. So samma means samma in the sense that it's leading to the Buddhist goal of enlightenment. Exactly, yes. Okay. Great. I okay, I'm rubbing my eyes. More or less everything. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you. And I do apologize if some of the answers were, were brief at the very end because I was getting a bit tired. And if they are, please ask them again. I think okay. it's very thorough, Ajahn. Thank you so much. And have a very pleasant afternoon, everybody, if you want to.